Even though you may know TV and movies aren't real, it can still break your heart when your fictional friends fall into a black hole or get stabbed in the neck by their evil clone. Unfortunately for us and our emotions, this makes for great storytelling, so here are some of the saddest on-screen death scenes you'll ever see. In the original Star Wars trilogy, Han Solo undergoes a classic heroic transformation. When you first meet him, he's a callous rogue who pushes others away and only cares about cash. But by the time Return of the Jedi rolls around, he's found redemption, purpose, and the love of his life. It's a nice, tidy ending, which is what made Han's actual fate in Star Wars The Force Awakens so grueling. Apparently, even in a galaxy so far, far away, happy endings are never quite so easy. While fans spent 30 years imagining that Han and Leia lived happily ever after, it turns out that their bouncing little boy became the next Darth Vader. Their marriage hit the rocks, and Han went back to smuggling. By the time the older Han finally makes his appearance, his famous wisecracks are now tinged with a sense of loss. This is a Millennium Falcon. You're Han Solo. I used to be. What makes Han's death the saddest scene in Star Wars history, though, is that he dies simply for trying to do right by his son. Even though the younger Han would have hit the road and the older Han knows Kylo Ren will probably kill him, the famously scruffy nerf herder can't help but make one final effort to redeem the kid he raised. From the moment Han first approaches Kylo, every fan in the universe knows he's about to get his Obi-Wan moment, but that only makes the eventual lightsaber stab even harder to watch. Breaking Bad was packed full of dark, grisly, and uncomfortable moments, but the one that everyone still winces over is the scene where Jesse's girlfriend Jane, asleep after a last hurrah drug binge, chokes on her own vomit, and Walt does nothing. It's an easy solution to prevent Jane from exposing him, which she'd earlier threatened to do. His conscious decision to allow Jane to die might be the moment where Walt truly broke bad in the most awful way. From that point on, there was no going back. Disturbing as this was, it's even worse when Jesse's later girlfriend, Andrea, is shot by Todd in the show's penultimate episode. While Jane and Jesse were largely terrible for each other, Andrea is just a single mother trying to give her son, Brock, a better life. And she's only murdered because Jesse refuses to cook meth for Todd's sociopathic gang of neo-Nazis. Todd casually shoots her in the back of the head while Jesse watches, leaving Brock an orphan. Just so you know, this isn't personal. The scene is brief, horrible, and impossible to forget, especially for Ian Posada, the young actor who played Brock, who, according to The Hollywood Reporter, reportedly teared up when he was shown the scene. The late Michael Clark Duncan was always a phenomenal actor, but the one movie that everyone will always remember him by is the screen adaptation of Stephen King's The Green Mile, in which he plays John Coffey, a wrongfully accused death row inmate with supernatural abilities. The film is filled with tons of tear-jerker moments, as Coffey's kindness, honesty, and compassion for others is shown in sharp contrast to the horrible treatment he receives from society. I'm tired of all the pain I feel in here in the world every day. Nothing compares, though, to the intensely heart-wrenching scene at the end of the film, where Coffey is finally executed in the electric chair. The characters are crying just as much as the audience, and the little touches, such as Coffey asking not to have the black hood put over his face since he's afraid of the dark, or the close-up of Coffey and Tom Hanks' Paul Edgecombe squeezing hands, leave a lasting impression. What's amazing about Sam Raimi's 2002 Spider-Man is that it somehow made the best superhero origin story ever even better. In the original comics, Peter Parker is just an average, selfish, teenaged kid preoccupied with girls and popularity, until his big ego results in his father figure getting killed. Hey, Michelangelo, don't forget we're painting the kitchen right after school. Got it? Sure thing, Uncle Ben. Don't start without me. Basically, while the genetically altered spider bite gives Peter strength and confidence, it's the weight of his own mistakes that forces him to grow up and take responsibility. All the key elements are the same between Raimi's film adaptation and its source material. Wise words are spoken. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. 
Peter lets a criminal get away, you know the drill. But Raimi's film made one slight alteration that cranked up the tears. Here, we see Uncle Ben die right before Peter's eyes, surrounded by onlookers. Uncle Ben? Peter. Over here, Uncle Ben. The entire movie relies on this scene working, and luckily, Cliff Robertson and Tobey Maguire knock it out of the park. If there's one big reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe hasn't shown Uncle Ben's death, perhaps it's because they knew they couldn't top this scene. Or this one. It seems like more Game of Thrones characters ended up dead than alive, and that's not even counting the whole army of corpses marching down Westeros. But the loss that hurt the most was Hodor, the lovable strongman who protected Bran with his dying breath, even though his tragic situation in life was, well, Bran's fault. Time travel is crazy, eh? Hold the door! Hold the door! Hold the door! Though Hodor spent much of the show's run as a humorous oaf who just said the same gibberish word over and over, his death scene completely redefined the character forever, revealing that Hodor actually meant hold the door, and that he'd known this whole time that he'd someday have to sacrifice his life doing just that. Twitter, and presumably the actual world, erupted in sadness following Hodor's death. The whole thing only gets more depressing when you rewatch the first season and realize that he's been lending a massive hand to Bran this whole time. The first words ever spoken to Hodor are, help Bran down the hall. Black Panther was perhaps the cinematic event of 2018, and a huge part of that success was due to the film's antagonist, Eric Killmonger, as played by Michael B. Jordan. Whether Killmonger is unforgivably torching Wakandan traditions, sending out mass shipments of weaponry, or simply crying at the loss of his father, he's always riveting, impossible to look away from, and deeply sympathetic. I found my daddy with panther claws in his chest! You ain't the son of a king, you're the son of a murderer! Killmonger is more than just a great character, though, because, as The Atlantic points out, his story also symbolizes the void permanently imposed on African culture by the transatlantic slave trade. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? These deeper themes are exactly what makes his death scene so powerful. After being mortally wounded by the film's hero, T'Challa, Killmonger mentions that his Wakandan father always praised the natural beauty of his homeland. Out of compassion, T'Challa then brings his wounded opponent back up the mountain so they can watch the sunset together, and offers to use Wakanda's advanced medical technology to heal him. Killmonger refuses to be saved. Instead, he asks to be buried at sea. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships, because they knew death was better than bondage. While Black Panther had a lot of moments that will go down in pop culture history, this was one of the biggest. We just made out a couple times. We just made out a couple times. Oh, Barb, the world hardly knew ye. Despite the fact that Barb only made it through a few episodes of Stranger Things before being shredded to pieces by the Demogorgon, this minor character spawned a huge number of fans collectively called the Cult of Barb by Salon. What it comes down to, really, is that Shannon Purser's character is just so intensely relatable. While most people haven't hung out at the pool while an otherworldly monster storms out of the woods and drags them into a dark dimension, many people can empathize with the feeling of being left out or trying to do the right thing while their flaky friend just gets some action in the other room. Barb's death scene is perhaps the ultimate example of what it feels like being the so-called third wheel, and that's probably why so many Stranger Things fans still miss her to this day. At the beginning of the 2004 relaunch of Battlestar Galactica, Anastasia D. Duala was one of the show's beacons of hope. Youthful, optimistic, and full of life, D. weathers the many challenges the fleet experiences, eventually finding love with Lee Apollo Adama. Even when D. and Apollo's marriage doesn't work out, she continues being one of the show's brightest characters, as the fleet searches through the universe for their mythical homeland, Earth. You have no idea what's happened to you. Today is just another day. Things quickly collapse when everyone finds out that Earth is actually a post-apocalyptic wasteland, 
As the crew tries to recover from this horrible reality, Dee and Apollo go out on a date and reconnect. It's a sweet, simple moment, leading audiences to believe that maybe now, even after the crew has seemingly lost everything, there's still hope for the future. Then Dee goes back to her locker, smiles in the mirror, savors the moment she shared with Lee, and ends her life. The scene is so shockingly tragic that actress Candace McClure told Sci-Fi that merely reading the script left her floored. It's safe to say that her fans had similar reactions. If there's one thing that Marvel's Avengers Infinity War will go down in history for, other than being the most ambitious cinematic crossover ever, it's the fact that at least half of everybody's favorite superheroes get killed by a bad guy snapping his fingers. Some Infinity War deaths may be more permanent than others, like Loki and Heimdall, but every single one of them hurts like crazy. The biggest shock, though, might be that moment on Titan where a certain wall-crawling, web-spinning underdog turns to dust. While everybody else, from Star-Lord to Black Panther, can barely blink before they're wiped out of existence, Spider-Man knows something is coming. He feels his spidey sense tingling, but there's nothing he can do to stop his inevitable erasure. And then came that damn line. I don't feel so good. And finally, as audiences everywhere let out a collective ugly sob. I don't want to go. I don't want to go, sir. Please. Please, I don't want to go. According to Screen Rant, both of these soul-crushing lines were improvised by actor Tom Holland. Sure, we all know that Peter is coming back, what with Far From Home taking place after Avengers Endgame. But still, that didn't make watching him go away any less heartbreaking. Sure, Bambi losing his mom was a downer, but if there was one animated classic that made millions of kids sob into the arms of their confused mothers, it was Don Bluth's 1988 dinosaur film The Land Before Time. What made The Land Before Time such a fantastic kids movie, and what the numerous sequels got so wrong, was that the script pulled no punches. From the first scene, Bluth's movie paints a vivid portrait of a once beautiful world brought to the edge of despair by famine where a herd of dinosaurs struggle to find food while defending attacks from the outside. Despair is everywhere, but at least you know Littlefoot will be okay, thanks to his wise, strong, devoted mother. Until suddenly, everything goes haywire. First, a sharp tooth storms in. Then an earthquake wrecks the place, and Littlefoot is left stranded. As rain and thunder pour down, the sad little dinosaur wanders alone through the blighted landscape, desperately crying out for his mom. When he finds her, she's already half dead. He pleads for her to get up, and when she says, I'm not sure I can, Littlefoot. Even the parents in the audience are probably wiping their eyes. One of the most memorable scenes of 1994's The Lion King is also the most heartbreaking, the traumatic death of Mufasa. After saving his son from a stampede, the doomed king desperately claws his way to safety only to get thrown back into the stampede's path by his own brother, Scar. Afterward, the orphaned Simba tries and tries to wake up his father, until he finally accepts there will be no waking up. He spends a long moment nuzzled against his father's corpse. The iconic death scene has a Shakespearean brutality, and it sets the stage for everything that comes after. Simba's legacy is ripped to pieces by his own uncle. It's grim and brutal, and not what you normally expect from a Disney cartoon. If you're part of a generation who grew up on the never-ending story, the playful grin of Falcor the Luck Dragon probably still comes back to you from time to time. What you might forget is that, like so many of your favorite movies from childhood, the underlying themes tend to be dark. Sure, there's giant turtles and friendly giants, but in a sense they're just decoration for a story that's all about keeping hope alive in the face of utter despair. Perhaps the saddest moment in the entire film is the death of Artax, the noble horse. The beautiful animal meets his painful end while accompanying his young owner Atreyu through the Swamp of Sadness. True to its name, the swamp's oppressive magic threatens to smother any who travel through it with their own anguish. And that's exactly what happens to poor Artax. No matter how much Atreyu begs and pleads for his friend to save himself, the horse is too consumed in his own hopelessness and allows himself to drown in the muck. 
It's been nearly a decade and a half since Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain first hit theaters, and it's easy to forget what a cultural event it was. A love story between cowboys played by Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger, Brokeback Mountain won awards, accolades, and a domestic gross of over $80 million against a $14 million budget. The story revolves around the decades-long relationship between Jack Twist and Anna Stillmar, which tragically ends when Ennis discovers through a postcard that his friend and lover has died. When Ennis calls for more information, he is told that Jack was killed when a tire he was changing exploded. But Ennis can't help but consider this might not be the truth. He imagines a more horrific story, with his mind flashing to the idea of Jack being brutally beaten to death with a tire iron. Jack's death is a total heartbreaker, but the uncertainty just makes it worse. In the real world, the chances that you've cried over a lost volleyball are quite slim. However, you probably also never found yourself stranded on an island with nothing but a random piece of sports equipment to keep you company, which is the situation in which Tom Hanks' character finds himself in 2000's Cast Away. Though few people have struggled with what Hank's character endured, it's easy to imagine how years of extreme isolation could force an inanimate object to become a friend. That's why when Chuck finally escapes the island, it's so heartbreaking when he accidentally loses Wilson. He dives into the water, risking his life and his chance to get home, all to save a volleyball. He eventually gives up, but his cries to his friend are so full of anguish, it feels like he's leaving a real person to drown. I'm sorry, Wilson! Wilson, I'm sorry! The scene also marks the key moment where Chuck begins a traumatic transition back to the civilized world, a place where volleyballs aren't allowed to be your friends, even if you draw lovable faces on them. For 16 years, Hugh Jackman brought Marvel's adamantium-clawed mutant renegade to life, earning fan adoration and a Guinness World Record for longest career as a live-action Marvel superhero in the process. Sadly, all good things must come to an end. While everyone hoped 2017's Logan would be a dark, brilliant conclusion to the most popular X-Men story, few could have predicted just how painful it would be to see Marvel's toughest, grittiest superhero reduced to a bitter, aching old man, poisoned by his own adamantium, with claws that didn't quite pop right anymore. While Wolverine never finds true happiness or peace, Logan does find something of a family. In a battle against his clone, Wolverine gives his life to save a group of innocent mutant children, including a girl who becomes a daughter-like figure to him, Laura. As Logan dies, impaled and covered in blood, he clutches Laura's hand, smiles, and says, so, oh, so this is what it feels like. Most superhero movies leave the audience walking out with smiles and laughter, but Logan was definitely the one where everyone left in tears. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.